Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is uh, Naresh Agarwal. Um, I'm an associate professor at the School of Library and Information Science at uh, Simmons College, at uh, Simmons University now. And thank you so much, Dania, for inviting me to speak to your class. And uh, you gave me the topic information behavior and context, uh, and which was very close to the, the book title that I have, which is uh, Exploring Context in Information Behavior. So I was thinking of the title as I was making the slides as to uh, context in information behavior versus information behavior and context, which are kind of uh, similar but a little different uh, and but closely related terms. So, the, so this is the book uh, that I just showed you, and uh, this came out uh, last year, and it's a Morgan and Claypool uh, Claypool Publishers. Uh, it was published by them as part of a series which is edited by Gary Marchionini. And uh, and you all are taking this class, which is um, theories of information science. And uh, I'm sure you must have been talking a lot about uh, information behavior in the class in general. So when we think of the term um, information behavior, there, are, there has been a lot of uh, debate on this term. Uh, some people uh, do not like the term behavior. And uh, earlier the field was called uh, INSU, which is information needs, seeking, and use. And then um, people think of uh, when you think of behavior, a lot of other terms that come into mind as well. Whereas is, is it just uh, anything to do with uh, looking for information or does it have other activities like finding information serendipitously when you're not really looking for it or avoiding information, organizing information, creating information, uh, capturing information, various things to do with information. Uh, so all of these uh, can be thought of as uh, coming under this big umbrella term called uh, information behavior. And information behavior can be seen as a, a field or a subfield within the wider field of information science, which, in a, which is a, easy to understand if you think of a triangle with a, sort of like three ends to it. And on the one hand, there is a people or the person. And on the other hand, there is information. And on the third side, there is a technology. So if you think of uh, an interaction of a person uh, with information, and sometimes mediated by technology and sometimes not. Like in this case, we're talking remotely, so our conversation is, is mediated by technology right now. So this triangle can be thought of as the area of, uh, uh, the, the area of concern for the field of information science. And information behavior is kind of a big part of uh, that field, which also includes other areas like, uh, like knowledge management or education in information science or health informatics, uh, lots of uh, other, other areas where you think of uh, the interaction of humans with information in various uh, domains or subdomains. So here, information behavior can be seen as uh, essential human activities, uh, which includes uh, the need for information and how we go about looking for information or seeking information when this need arises. Uh, um, a Donald Case had a very famous book uh, called Looking for Information, uh, which is now in its uh, fourth edition um, with Lisa Given. Uh, so, so the concern of that book has been about looking for information and this entire field has had information seeking as one of the key areas of, uh, of uh, the activities of someone when you think of information behavior. And this seeking can be alone, like when, when I'm going online, I can look for information. Uh, I'm using a browser, I can go to the library or look for a book. Or sometimes it can be collaborative uh, with other people. So let's say that I am in a in a go-to meeting or a Zoom call with someone, and then we both are working on a paper together, and then we look for information for the paper that we're working on. So that is a collaborative way of looking for information when you're working with someone, and teams can look for information as well. And this can happen uh, at work. So a lot of um, the research on information behavior has been, or information seeking has been at, uh, has been looking at task-based information behavior, where people have uh, to fulfill some task at work, and to fulfill that task, what are the sources uh, that, they, that they use and, and what are the ways in which they engage with information and with sources or with technology in order to fulfill that work-related task. Uh, so that has been the focus of a large aspect of information uh, seeking, information behavior, and other related areas like information retrieval, human computer interaction, and so on. Uh, but some researchers like uh, Savalainen and uh, some other people 
uh, they've started uh, looking at information, not just uh, from an organizational point of view or, or the organizational context of information, but also the daily life uh, of a person uh, and everyday life as to, um, and everyday life and the way we, we go and look for information uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. So th both these can be the, the concern of information seeking within this big umbrella of information behavior. And this search could be in person when I go and talk to someone face to face or when I go to the go to a library and look for a book, or it can also be be virtual uh, and that is mediated by technology. And when I say virtual, it could include things like uh, uh, talking to someone over the phone or through video conferencing or through audio calls, or it could mean uh, as asynchronous medium like uh, like sending someone an email or or an, or a short or an SMS. And uh, or it could be the just going online and looking for information on Google and Wikipedia and so on. So there are various ways in which we interact uh, with information, and we, which could be with uh, with people or with uh, other impersonal sources. And then uh, information behavior also look includes using the information that we find. Are we just looking something uh, looking for something to satisfy our curiosity, or do we have uh, a decision that we need that we need to make in order to use that information. And it could, it could also include uh, areas like avoiding information. Um, one of the research that I'm working on right now is uh, looking at how, to, how do people deal with uh, non-responses to messages. So when you send, uh, when, you, when you call someone or, or when you send a message and if you don't get a response back, then how do you uh, make sense of that? So that has, has also been, uh, it, that is also something which is part of this big umbrella of information behavior. And avoiding includes other also cases where, let's say that somebody is diagnosed with a certain disease and the person does not want to deal with that information and doesn't want to know more right now because the person doesn't feel emotionally ready uh, to, to face that information. So those are the times, those are the types of things which also come under information avoidance. And then we have uh, accidental encountering or serendipitous encountering of information where you have uh, sort of like a, a need for information that, I'm, that I might currently have but there could be a buried need or, or a need which I had in the past, but which I hadn't thought about uh, for a while now. And then as I, as I go about uh, my day-to-day -day task, and then I find that information that I, that I had needed at that point in time or, with, or which maybe somebody else needs and uh, I want to help that person. And when I suddenly find that, uh, I, I have this instant, uh, instantaneous aha reaction on finding that information. And uh, that has been the, the focus of uh, researchers looking at, uh, um, at accidental encountering, for, accidental information encountering. And uh, that was also a big, big part of the research of Professor Sandra Ardeles. So she looks at uh, serendipity and there are other researchers working in this area as well. So this is a sort of um, a figure of the field to explain. So we, when we can think of uh, this person and this person is pretty much uh, at, at the center of this field of, uh, of information uh, seeking or information behavior. And uh, Brenda the Derwin, uh, she likes to, uh, to call this person as, as Mr. Squiggly and she actually has kind of a squiggled uh, or, or a muddled uh, head for the person. And uh, what that means is that uh, this person has uh, a certain uh, messiness that's going about uh, uh, in the day-to-day -day life. When we think of uh, people, when we, when we think of research studies, right, we often talk about information behavior of, uh, of students or information behavior of doctors, of lawyers, uh, of, uh, or in various different uh, work contexts or work arenas. And, and that in, in a certain way is not the whole truth because uh, we are trying to categorize a group of people into trying to understand something. And people within each of those groups are also different. And uh, they all, all out there trying to make sense of the world in their own ways. So Derwin sort of describes this, this actor or the person as uh, a body, mind, heart, and spirit uh, moving through time and space with the past uh, history and then uh, some present experiences and some dreams for the future. That, so it's like, a, and, and to that extent, we are, we are all uh, similar in having a, a similar need and in similar need of wanting to be loved and accepted or, or trying to make sense of the world. And at the same time, we all, also want to stand out from the crowd and want to be different uh, and, and sort of leave our own mark. And this is the, the actor or the person which is uh, at the heart of any, any study or any talk about information behavior. 
And uh, so this person could be a knowledge worker, a working person, a data analyst, a child, a student, or any other person. And uh, either at work or in, or in daily life, this person has a certain need for information uh, that arises. And when that need arises, uh, you start uh, looking for information. So, so, so maybe uh, a need for me might have been to, 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 to figure out how to connect to the call with you, with you all today. And then I go and check my email and uh, get the link, which uh, the, the Zoom call link, which Danya had sent me. So that was a, a basic information need that I had at, at this point in time. And for that, I used the information source, which was my email. And so, so, so depending on, on various kinds of uh, needs, you might have shorter or longer duration of the seeking process. So you start looking for information. And you might go and uh, ask your friends or colleagues about it, or you can go to a reference librarian in the, in the library, or, or we can go and look for books and manuals. Or we can look, uh, do information search or retrieval from computer-based systems, and uh, we can interact with these systems through either desktop computers or laptop computers or smartphones and tablets in, in various ways, and either synchronous or asynchronous ways in, in interacting with this information. And sometimes we find information now uh, serendipitously when we're not really looking for it directly. And as this information comes about, uh, we try to make sense of this information. Uh, and uh, some of our need uh, gets uh, fulfilled. But then as we find this information, now uh, new questions might arise. And then we might try to refine our searches or ask follow-up questions. And the search sort of uh, continues uh, for a while. And at some point, uh, we might decide uh, to give up. And we give up not because all our questions are answered, but we give up uh, because we think that it's enough for what we need to do right now. Are we uh, we're probably tired or, or, or and, and mostly it's that uh, there, there's also this principle of least effort. We want to put in only, only as much effort as, uh, as we think is necessary. So in that, uh, to some extent, uh, so depending on, on, our, on our propensity for least effort or the amount of effort, if the task is really important, then we put in more effort. and. Uh, we, we do find the information and the cycle sort of uh, continues until, until we give up at, at, at some stage. And there are also times when you avoid the information. And this whole thing is in this big umbrella called information behavior. And then there is, there is this term uh, context. So context is uh, often seen as something that, uh, which gives rise to the need. So whenever we think of uh, an information need of an individual, that is a time when we think of uh, what is the context of, the, of that need. So for instance, uh, if you're trying to help someone, uh, as, as some person has a, has a question about something, then you ask like, like uh, tell me the whole thing or tell me the story or tell me the context of it. You want to know how and why is that information needed. And when, when, when you know, if let's say the person is a student and trying to look for information for a certain assignment at co in class, then that, that's one context. Or if somebody is an office worker and needs to is working on a product to deliver to a client, and that's another context. So different uh, work contexts uh, will have different uh, levels of need. But uh, one of the big questions uh, that came to my mind was uh, what this context really means. And this goes back to my uh, PhD years when I was designing a study looking at knowledge workers and their information uh, behaviors uh, in, in organizations. And my PhD advisor at the point in time asked me to do some research in context and. Uh, what I realized was that as I started digging, digging up uh, and reading more and more about context, uh, I felt myself and trying to like peel onions. So you find you, you get into one layer and then you find that there's another layer inside it and then you get into another layer and then you find there's something else uh, the inside of it. So it, was, it took me a long time to, to try and, and wrap my head around uh, what context really means. And it, and it was perhaps, uh, to, much, to some extent, I'm still making up my uh, figuring it out, but to, to some extent, it was uh, it was about I think uh, a decade of trying to make sense of uh, what this term uh, really means. So that is uh, this that is what led to this uh, this book that I wrote. And when we think of uh, why, right, the why behind context, now now this is uh, this is an important term. So one more thing is uh, as I was telling you about. Uh, the context giving rise to the need, right? When I was writing the book, uh, there were lots of debates. Um, and one of the things which uh, struck at that point was that 
does my need arise in a certain context as I talked about uh, in terms of either a work context or a study context or at, or at home or everyday life context? Or does my interaction with information at, at a given point in time give rise to the context? Which means that uh, I'm a professor and somebody tries to do a study on the information behavior of a professor or information behavior of educators. That could be uh, one way of looking at it. But I'm also the, also a father, or I'm also a husband, or I'm also a son, and uh, or I'm also a friend. And uh, as I interact, or I'm also a customer when I go to a store. So I have various roles that I that I take on at different uh, points in time. And in each of my interactions with people and my interactions with information, I might uh, be interacting with different different things uh, or in different ways. And I might have expertise in a certain area, not have expertise in a certain area. So my interact, interaction with information or, or with people or with uh, technology at different points in time th is different. So you can think of while, while the person is the same, there are different contexts uh, that arise uh, at the point of interaction with information. And so it's kind of a chicken and egg uh, problem. So the context gives rise to the need, but also the need also gives rise, rise to the context which shapes your, your searching and seeking process. And when you think of uh, why context, right? So any person of, who is a service provider, so let's say it's a university trying to provide the best education to students, or it is a library trying to provide the best services to its patrons, or it's a hospital trying to cater to patients, uh, or, it's, like, or it's, it's any, any government that's trying to cater to its population. Any person who wants to provide any kind of uh, service to people, can only do it effectively if you understand the needs of these people. And how do you understand the needs? You have to understand the environments that they live, work, and operate in, and you have to understand uh, the contexts uh, that they face uh, in, in the day-to-day -day life. And uh, I was actually uh, thinking of this yesterday, and, uh, and I thought that uh, trying to describe context is in, is in a way somewhat like trying to define God, or, or for a fish, trying, or is, in a way it's like for, like a fish uh, trying to define water or a fish looking for water because a fish sort of uh, lives in water and operates in water and is now trying to go and uh, and searching for water and, and that's pretty much the way, way I, I see as context is it's sort of everywhere and in everything and then it's uh, difficult when I have to so when people come and ask me that, like what is your book about and when I tell them it's about context then they're like what, what does context really mean so there is a context to, to everyone and, and to everything. So we can't really, really understand and begin to provide uh, services to people or begin to provide, begin to create software systems that, that cater to users without really understanding uh, their context in some manner. And that is why in software design, context-aware computing has been a big area. And also in uh, information-seeking behavior and in information science, context has been really big. And we have had conferences called uh, information seeking in context or information interaction in context. And in a lot of the papers uh, submitted to ACIST and JSIST and other places uh, and in iConference and all, you do find uh, context or contextual variables uh, being a big part of um, any, any of the studies. So if we did not take uh, context into consideration, then we could assume that uh, everyone, everything behaves in a predictable manner. So it, so it is an attempt to paint everything or everyone with a, with a broad st stroke of color and context. Uh, so that's, this is how the world would look uh, sort of without context. And when we take uh, context into consideration, uh, then we, we do see, uh, we can see the nuances of things much better. Uh, Naresh? Yes, Danya. Could you share, uh, share the slides? Because we, the slides appear on, uh, at the top of the screen, but I guess you need to share them. Uh, you're not able to see the slide so far. Is it fine? Oh, there, you oh. Go. there. got it. Got it. Yes, yes, got it. Okay, okay, okay thank Okay. So then the the question comes in uh, as to what is is context, and that was the that was the big thing. Uh, the moment I got to this question of, so what is context? That is, the that is when I realized that I didn't know what I was getting into. And uh, here you find that uh, some people see context as uh, the environment uh, or the container. So in a, this is the most common definition of context. 
So when we, when we say the information behavior of medical residents or information behavior of children or toddlers or information behavior of doctors and lawyers uh, or students, we are trying to, to think of the person or the, or the user or the actor. And then we're trying to think of some sort of an environment that surrounds uh, the person or, the, or some sort of a container. And that is what has been, see, been is commonly seen as uh, a definition of, uh, of context in, in a lot of uh, studies. And uh, some people also see context as a setting. So uh, the, a library or an archive or, or, or a university or a workplace uh, or, or, or an organization or a company, all of those uh, set or a school or university, all of those are different kinds of settings which are seen as a context in which uh, the information needs arises and the person engages in, uh, in the search uh, or other, other forms of information behavior. And uh, Context is also seen as a role, a doctor or lawyer or a cyclist or any other person or a professor or a student or, or, a, or a speaker or an, or an attendee, for instance. And context is seen as situation as well, uh, something that uh, happens to people, things that we are thrown in suddenly. And when we are thrown into situations or thrown into something, then we find ways to deal with it or try to make sense of it. So that is also, the, that is also something that it, something where, where we see that context is uh, or in a, a, way to, a way in which it is defined. So one of the discussions that has been is about is context the same as situation or is situation a smaller term and, and context is a bigger term. So once a, same, a bigger context might have different situations within it. So there has been some debate surrounding, surrounding this as well. And then some people say that uh, context is uh, an actor's mind. So when I say the actor, in this case, I mean the user or the person, right? Um, some people didn't uh, like the term user so much because when you think of a user, you think of using something and using a technology or using a software or using a website. So user is a term that's used a lot in software development. And the actor is, is a more independent term as, as seen as a person who acts, uh, who goes about daily life and, and acts, uh, uh, acts in a certain way when, when interacting with information. So when I think of my mind, right, one of the questions that come about, come about is that uh, the world that I see it, is that independent of me or is that a part of me? So when I'm, let's say I'm sitting on this chair right now, is this chair a separate entity or is, or is, is what is more important is what I think of this chair? So to some extent, it is about uh, trying to look at the world, not as independent of people, but a way in which we look at the world and the stories we weave and the way we interact with the world. So if there are seven or, eight, seven or seven plus billion people in the world, do we have one world or do we have seven billion different worlds where each world resides in the mind or the brain of the person? And uh, so, so that is, the, the, is one way of looking at context as something that reside, resides in the person's mind. And then uh, context can also be, be seen as information sources and channels. Uh, um, so for instance, a telephone, uh, a phone screen, um, or or any any other book, or or, or a person. So all the information sources uh, that we use to interact with people, and the channels of communication that we use, whether it is face to face or whether it's online or uh, or in any other way that we any medium that we use to get to information. So the channel or the medium is that uh, context. So all of these. Uh, the, these kinds of various kinds of information sources are also seen as uh, as seen as context. Uh, and Diane Sonnenwald, uh, in her theory of information horizons, she calls it uh, this a totality of the options that you have available to you. She describes these as the information horizon uh, that, that an actor has access to. And then uh, context can also be seen as the constraints that you have. So even though you want to do certain things, but you are bound. Uh, uh, but you have a certain constraint, like for instance, uh, one of the constraints uh, with a conversation right now is that uh, I'm not there in person with you, so we are interacting remotely. So that's a constraint. And a lot of times uh, our interaction with information is constrained by certain, the certain things, uh, situations or, or, or the, in, a certain uh, things that, that, that stop us from going any further than what we do. And uh, context can also be seen as uh, as something that arises during uh, conversations or, or during discourse. Uh, and as we talk, uh, initially there are areas of disagreements and uh, then we find that there is a certain uh, commonality uh, or a certain common ground that happens uh, in our interaction with each other. And this uh, sense of trying to find something common uh, 
it is a is a part of again uh, this discourse is 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 what some people say is that is a, is a context of where something arises or the need for information arises and context can also be seen as uh, assign meanings during interaction so as we interact with information what are the meanings that we assign and uh, one of the one of the chapters that i wrote uh, for daniel's book was on, on a child's interaction with an ipad and uh, on, on that interaction as well one of the, is, is that context uh, that that's one thing and then there are other aspects of co of context so for instance uh, context is seen as a as a physical context let's say the room that i'm sitting in right now that is that is a part of my context uh, my conversation with you or or the uh, the class that you are taking which is theories of information science uh, theories in information science so that is a context as well you have the context of uh, the university of tennessee in oxville that, that that is something common between you that is a part of a common context and uh, sometimes let's say that i am in an airport and walking out of the airport then uh, the physical context changes because I'm in the airport and then, and then as I'm stepping out to board a taxi, um, then the physical context changes because things around me change. I'm from the airport and then outside of it and now into a taxi. But then the person I'm talking to all the time, that thread of conversation continues. So, the, so that part of the context is again uh, same, and, but yet the surrounding context has changed. So context is again changing and it is something that can be carried from, from place to place as well. And one of the things which I talk about in the book is also this idea of, uh, of uh, context being more physical. So a lot of the people say that uh, please switch off your mobile phones and uh, be with the person uh, that you're talking to, especially over dinner and all. So, so trying to be away from, um, from technology when you're talking to people. So be more physically present is one, is one way in which people try to describe uh, the context of the people. And yet, uh, what do you do if... Uh, if your physical context is not pleasant. So let's say a person sees an accident scene somewhere, or if a person is in a stressful situation, then being on a call with someone maybe is a good way for the person to escape from the physical context and get into a virtual context. So one of the, so it's something for us to think about is that it context, uh, something based on the time, a certain place at a time, time, or it's something that engage, or is context something that engages our mind and, uh, and, and, and a state of mind is what, is what better describes what we want to interact with rather than the physical versus virtual aspects of it. So then the next question was, uh, what's the boundary of context? How do we delineate and define what is context and what is not context? So there have been um, different definitions to this as well. So one of the definitions is, uh, talks about context being a set of things, factors, elements, and attributes that are related to an entity. So in this case, the entity is a, the, is a person interacting with information or the information behavior. So related to an entity in important ways, but not so closely related to the entity that they are considered to be exclusively part of the entity itself. So that is one definition. And I thought it was a, it was a good definition in some ways. Uh, and this, this person is saying that almost everything is context, except that uh, is a context of that person. So let's say if I'm, if I'm talking about a person's, uh, context of a person, person's interaction with information, so almost everything is context except for that person or that, or that particular interaction. So that was one way of looking at uh, trying to separate the context from the person. And the boundary between the entity and the context is continually negotiated and renegotiated. So what is context and not is not fixed, it's fluid, it's changing all the time. And context is of the actor engaged in an activity at the point of interaction. So the, one, of the, one of the points which I made earlier was that you can, when we say that, uh, the context of a professor looking for interact with information is not fixed. So that will depend if I'm in, if I'm in a store trying to trying to buy tomatoes. So at that point, my interaction is, is very different. So the point of interaction is an important part of trying to define an, an actor's uh, like context uh, in, in, in interacting with information. So there are various views of context. Uh, so one of the three major views which uh, which Christina Cotwright had summarized in a, in a review article for, for ARIST in 2007, was that, uh, that the, the biggest streams of research had tried to club context into, into one of three, three areas. One is context as container or context as environment, which was a part of a lot of survey studies, experiments, a lot of research studies where context was seen as a container. And a lot of ethnographic studies, a lot of interpretive studies, uh, and, uh, and uh, and a lot of interview-based studies uh, saw context as construed meaning, 
at what was the meaning that you're trying to derive in your interaction with a lot of qualitative studies uh, saw context as uh, construed meaning and uh, the meaning that uh, meaning that you try to draw out of your interaction with your uh, survey with your interview participants and uh, there was another thread which saw construct as socially constructed so as i interact with people or, or as i see myself as part of a group or part of a team and the, the cohesive uh, feeling of familiarity or feeling of oneness that you feel with other people and when that leads to something common or when people collaborate in, in teams and all that social construction is was also seen as con as context so there were these three basic uh, strands of what was seen as context so then the question that came to my mind was that if context is something that is if that is in my mind so if everything that i think of if, uh, think of as the context so this chair is not out, outside of me but what i try to make sense of it is con if that is context versus the chair being a separate objective outside part of me like like a container or, or like in in this case uh, context being separate from the from the research participant so which of these views was correct was the question and that's the, that's a time when this moment of uh, of epiphany or trying to realize came in was that none of these were actually incorrect they were just different ways of trying to describe or trying to look at uh, context and uh, this is what i sort of uh, used to describe this and uh, this idea of uh, an uh, elephant so if you think of this uh, context as this elephant or this metaphor of elephant and there's a story of um, the six blind men and there was, there was some person who saw the the, the tail of the elephant and 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 thought that oh, oh this is just like like a rope uh, and 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 some person um, saw the saw, saw the the leg of the elephant and thought that it was a, it was a tree trunk so so and and some person saw the trunk of the elephant and thought that it was a snake so it was uh, different people saw different parts of the same thing and then or, or, and then thought that it was different things so similarly the, i thought this was a good analogy for for context as well where we are trying to uh, look at the same thing but looking at it in different ways and depending on where we are looking at at from we would get different understandings of what we think is context so there is this uh, theory the called the, the social identity theory and uh, the, as per this theory right there is this idea that uh, that we we th th there's this idea of how we try to make sense of the world and uh, there's a lot of debate especially in the us right now and also in other parts of the world uh, on this idea of um, of us versus them right who and who are the us and and who are the them um, in this case so so one of the things uh, which is in the in the book is that uh, i'll just uh, maybe uh, get the book out so i have uh, and this is this is some part of the book where i have uh, where i have this this framework and uh, here i quote uh, ravindranath tagore who was a, a nobel laureate in literature and uh, he had a, an essay collection called the creative unity where he writes that uh, we are in a haste to seek for general types and overlook the individuals and when we fall into the habit of neglecting to use the understanding that comes of sympathy in our travels our knowledge of foreign people grows insensitive and therefore easily becomes both unjust and cruel in in its character and also selfish and contemptuous and contemptuous in its application and it, it has been admitted that the dealings between different races of humans are not merely between individuals that a mutual understanding is either aided or or else obstructed by the general emanations forming the social atmosphere and these emanations are a collective ideas and collective feeling generated according to special historical circumstances and setting examples tagore goes on to explain that people have a certain collective idea of people based on race ethnicity skin color gender nationality profession religion etc that obscures their humanity and when we approach a person who is under the influence of this collective collective idea he or she is no longer a pure individual with the conscience fully awake to the judging of the value of a human being the person is more or less a passive medium for giving expression to the sentiment of a whole community or another collective idea based on race gender skin color etc So it is evident that this collective idea is not creative it is merely institutional it adjusts human beings according to some mechanical arrangement it emphasizes the, the negative side of the individual the separateness it hurts the complete truth so basically when we look at uh, people right 
we find that people have certain circles uh, around them and these circles uh, can be seen as circles of race circles of ethnicity circles of of skin color of age of gender uh, of sexual preference and so on so lots of different ways in which we can think uh, we can try to stereotype people and we have the same circles inside of us as well and what we have inside of us uh, but when we think of ourselves we try to think of the person in in us much more and we have these various circles but uh, some identities of ours are important to us and some less important and a lot of the times when we stereotype people uh, we we tend to the to put people uh, in these big circles so according to the to the social identity theory right here when we have uh, uh, this theory is by Tajfal uh, and Turner and it was in 1979 that they came up with it so that these two people that uh, called the interpersonal or in group and there's the intergroup which is that which has in group and out group uh, used to denote that so basically the um, in the in the extreme of fully interpersonal behavior which is this one interactions between two or more individuals is fully determined by their interpersonal relationships and individual characteristics and not at all affected by various social groups or categories to which they respectively belong for example if when you when you're talking about people talking to a close friend or to a spouse even though they might have different interests or they might belong to certain ca categories you have a certain personal relationship with them and you see them without judging and you you see them for who they are but a lot of the times when we uh, when there are new people we meet we, we might tend to stereotype so so there is this other extreme over here which is called a fully intergroup behavior so interactions between two in, two or more individuals or groups of individuals are fully determined by the respective memberships in various social groups or categories and not at all affected by their uh, inter individual uh, personal relationships between the people involved so for example the behavior at a negotiating table of members representing representing two parties in an intense intergroup conflict so the basic idea is is, is that uh, that there is this uh, stereotyping that we often engage in uh, in our daily lives and there are people that we feel close to and and we don't stereotype as much uh, with with those people and i try to apply that uh, theory to the idea of context or coming up with the delineating the boundaries of context so in the first case when we see construct context as constructed meaning or the personal view of context in which case uh, i it is a it is a i in context or me as a person trying to study my own context so when i do that i might be part of various circles there might be various information sources uh, that i'm more familiar with as compared to others and there are there are people that i consider to be part of my shared context and there are people who i do not know much about or who did who i do not like or understand and who can be who are people who attend to stereotype or see them as part of group of closed circles and these are the context that are stereotype and these and uh, this is uh, this is me trying to study my own context so that's not the first view or the personal view of context and in the second view let's say that i'm working with uh, collaborating with uh, with danya on a research project so then uh, danya and me we might have our own uh, personal context and then we also have a shared context uh, uh, as collaborators or as researchers working working in a common area and uh, then when we have uh, and we might both both have uh, contexts of people that we stereotype or people that we don't understand or don't want to include in a study uh, so so that is uh, that this is a, a more shared view or, or a collaborative view of context where the cib here stands for collaborative information behavior or the we in context or the socially constructed con constructed context which is there in earlier studies and then the third is this idea of context as a container which is more uh, of a stereotype view of context which is not real and which is what tagore alludes to as when we're trying to see people as as part of the groupings that they belong to so when we say information seeking behavior of uh, doctors and lawyers or policy makers in which case we are trying to see people as a part of the circles that they belong to and most of the survey studies or experiment based studies or policy based studies are actually uh, when we think of it they are doing some sort of stereotyping uh, in this process of uh, of trying to to understand and even though some ethnographic studies do make a, a concerted effort in trying to understand the individual but even in this case uh, despite the best efforts we don't really get the full picture so the i quote uh, one thing over here from uh, 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 one of my uh, my phd friends uh, my facebook friends and she wrote uh, once on a feed saying that uh, while i appreciate the the concept behind behind someone telling me that they understand the truth is that no one understands what you're going through or or who you really are 
And no one has the right to belittle you by saying that they know your pain or struggle. No one does. Let's just keep things honest and say that, and just say I care rather than I know. So the, the idea in, in, in this is that despite your best efforts, you might not really uh, know the best of, know, know everything about which, what is to know. And despite uh, ethnographic researchers or people who are doing qualitative studies trying to know the, uh, know the actor or the, or the person or the research participant, you might not really get the full picture. And uh, then as we go about, the next part of my the study looked at the elements of context. So what are the parts of the whole that make up context in, in research studies? So the, when we take these three views of context uh, over here, the personal view, the shared view, and the stereotyped view, and the personal view is, is often the closest because that's a view that is closest to us. So I call, I denote this as IB or information behavior. And, the, and then there's a shared view of the view of, uh, of the world that we share as, with people as, as part of belonging together in a certain manner. So that's a collaborative information behavior over here. And then there's a stereotype view of context where we see people or participants as being part of a certain circle or a certain group. And uh, what I found was that there are seven major categories in which context was studied when you think of uh, contextual variables. So this was the environment uh, of, a set of the actor, the task or the activity or the problem that the, that the actor was engaged in when looking for information, the information need of that person, or what was the information required for the person to, to in, in order to fulfill that task, the actor's mind or the actor uh, himself or herself, uh, the source or the channel or the information system that the person was interacting with, uh, the relationship between the actor and the source, and finally, the um, time and space. So all of these, uh, um, if we take these seven variables or seven categories of variables into consideration, I found, I found that uh, we pretty much get an exhaustive list of all that is to study uh, about an, a, a person's interaction with, with information. So these were the seven elements of context, what I call it uh, over here. And then what I did was that I tried to take these ele elements of context and I tried to put these into various views of context, the personal view or the stereotype view, or the shared view. So in this example, I tried to look, show these, uh, these variables within the personal view. So in the, if you look at the personal view of context, so let me go back and, and show the personal view again. Uh, this was a personal view of context. So in which case you have your, your shared, uh, um, you, you have uh, your own personal context, different circles that you feel you belong to, and certain shared context that you feel with other people and you have a common circle with. And then people that you, that you stereotype or things that are information sources that are outside, outside your area of knowledge or influence or area or, or people that you don't want to know about. So here, uh, when, when I try to place these, ele these uh, elements of context within that view, what I see here is that uh, we can think of this as uh, the three views, the personal context, the shared context, and the stereotype con context. And then uh, here you have the, the actor who has some need for information. And then on the other side, you have, let's say, a work environment. And uh, as part of your work, uh, maybe a, a task comes about, or you're supposed to work, work on some problem. And because of this uh, problem that you need to work on, some information is required now because you want to fulfill that task. And you have, you have an idea of uh, trying to go and, uh, and look for information. So you decide to go and ask someone for it, or you, start, you decide to go to the a library or go online for, for information. And uh, one of the things, the difficulty is that, is that information source or a system as something as part of a shared context, or is it a part of a stereotype context? Is it something that you understand or something that you don't understand? And that really depends upon uh, your relationship with the source or your degree of comfort with the source. So this uh, source of the system or channel uh, could be a shared context if, if you have a very good relationship with a person that you're trying to get information from, and could be a, a, could be a, a stereotype context when you know that the person knows a lot, but you don't really have a good relationship with the person, you don't really know whether the person will be willing to help you with the information. And the same depends with whether, you, if it's a book or a source that you really understand, you're highly familiar with it. And if you have a less degree of familiarity, then this source will be placed within the stereotyped part of the context. So the actor source relationship forms uh, an important part of this uh, of this this time when you're looking for information, and also time and space play a major role when you're trying to interact uh, with information. So then, based on these seven categories or seven elements, I try to look uh, find various different variables in in past studies and context uh, during the past twenty or thirty years, 
and which can be used in research studies. And for environment, uh, a lot of what has been studied is things like the type and then your organizational structure, diversity, flexibility, organizational decision-making style. For task, there's a type, nature, goal, dimension, and so on. The need, again, what triggers the information need? Uh, and uh, for information required, how do you judge how much is enough? Uh, whether the information required is tacit or complex? Uh, is it something that is observable? For the actor, the demographics of the actor, the, the, the style of coping, the personality, and then uh, habits, hobbies, uh, tenure, maybe a, a disability, um, the, the social role, domain knowledge, knowledge state, information overload, attitude, all of those are things that concern the actor. And things to do with the source are things like the source quality, the, the source reliability, usefulness. Uh, and uh, for a device, things like the apps, accessibility, speed, all of those are, are the types of variables that have been studied under source. And for actor source relationship, things like the comfort, degree of comfort, uh, expectation, degree of familiarity with the source. And for time and space, time of interaction, immediacy, uh, estimation of time needed, duration, uh, place of interaction, spatial location, and so on. So when we think of context from a research studies point of view, all of these can be seen of what make up uh, context or what has been studied as, studied as context in various studies uh, in informa information science and in information behavior. So then um, I came up with a, a definition of context uh, at that stage. So the, in the book I have, uh, in the final chapter, I have uh, about uh, 12 co conclusions that I, that I arrived at. So that is at the, uh, at the later part here. And uh, I have, uh, the context is, is of an entity with respect to a behavior or activity. Here the entity in question is actor engaged in any information behavior, which can include information seeking, information searching and retrieval, interaction with the person or device, serendipitous finding, collaborative information behavior and so on. A context is always created at the point of interaction, although we could define interaction more broadly than just interaction with a computer or device which the field of human computer interaction is concerned with, we can understand it based on the actor's interaction with information. So context is of the actor engaged in an activity at the point of interaction. Context is always about relationship of an actor with elements outside of the, of the actor, with people, artifacts, processes, situations, environment, or even of the actor with themselves, depending on who's watching. For example, with actor with respect to the task, actor with respect to the situation, and so on. Context is not one whole concept, which will look the same from every direction. Depending on who you are, where you're looking from, and who the actor in question is, context will appear dif different, differently to you. There are, few, there are three views of context, the actor's personal view, the shared view, and the stereotype view. The first two views may be mostly used by the inter interpretivist researcher, that is the shared view and the personal view. The positivist researcher and the system developer may, may be using the third uh, stereotype view. And for an actor looking at one's own context, uh, everything will appear as context. The actor's personal context, such as thoughts, feelings, identities, are abilities, etc. The shared context of the actor is a part of groupings based on age, gender, ethnicity, religion, region, and so on. Those that the actor considers in-group. And the stereotype context of the actor, people and artifacts that the actor is not familiar with or chooses not to identify with. However, an interpretive researcher studying the context in one's own, studying the actor in one's own context might decide to focus more on the dynamic aspects of the context and may or may not choose to include the more stable attributes relating to the actor, source, and other elements. So basically, the Things that are more fixed, like uh, the age of something which cannot really change, or the, uh, or the background, the, the, ed the economic or educational background, th those are more fixed. Maybe that, that may not be of some concern with the, with, with the researcher. And, and the researcher may be more concerned with things like attitude or, or things which are more likely to change with time in study. So for an actor looking at one's own context with a friend, colleague, or collaborator, part of a shared group, context includes the personal context of the two actors, and the individual or collective stereotype context of the two people. So here too, the interpretivist researcher may choose to focus more on, the, on those context attributes that are likely to change across situations. And for a positivist research or system designer, context will be everything that surrounds the actor, such as the physical setting, the environment, people, colleagues, computers, and so on, but, not, but does not include the actor. So more than simply surrounding, Lee stresses on the importance of entities being related to the actor. He defines context as a set of uh, things, factors, elements, and attributes that are related to a target entity in important ways, but are not so closely related to the target entity that are considered to be exclusively part of uh, the target entity itself. Thus, the researcher may choose to not see the more stable attributes of actors and of sources or channels uh, as part of a context of an interaction. 
And the elements of the context of an actor engaged in an activity includes the aspects of the environment, the task or the problem situation, the need for information, the actor, the source system, the, the relationship and time and space. Those are the seven things that I talked about, the seven elements of the seven categories. And the relationship between the elements of and the different views of context can be understood via properties which help to perceive the central structures and, reg and regularity and the determined dynamism between the modular descriptions of context. They condense the differences in the examination levels within components of uh, context. So I didn't really cover the properties part in my talk so far, but it's there discussed more in the book. And the elements of context can differ based on the level of magnitude ranging from micro to macro. This property pertains to the length of viewing context whereby an where a nearby element, for example, of a cup of, cup of coffee or book one is reading, etc., would be part of the micro context. And an element far away, for example, the government, a neighbor, the, the, the next street could, could be macro. And the different elements of context during the course of an interaction would differ based on the, on the level of dynamism, ranging from the static to the dynamic. The things that remain mostly constant over time, for example, one's office space time of browsing, etc., is static. While things that change, uh, for example, the web page one is reading are dynamic. And elements of context may be repetitive and non-repetitive. For example, may follow a pattern ranging from rhythmic to random. So if, for example, the time that we wake up could be the same time that we do every day or the other kind of uh, habits that we have a daily basis. So those are the most stable parts of the days. And yet there are things that happen every day which are the more, uh, more dynamic aspects. So for example, the actor might use the Facebook app on a, on a smartphone on a regular basis but use another app infrequently. And a person in an office job would have a more regular surrounding context as opposed to a traveling salesman. And then there could be numerous combinations between different elements of context, many of which co-occur on a frequent or regular basis in an actor's information behavior. And the actor might need to respond to a situation on a regular basis. For example, a student needing to answer the questions, queries raised by a professor in the same classroom and at the same day of the uh, time of the day during the semester. So these are some uh, conclusions about what I tried, what I understood uh, as context is based on all the research and based on, on different uh, theoretical uh, understandings. And based on this, finally, I arrived at this definition of context, which is the context of, the, of an actor's information behavior consists of elements such as environment, task, actor, actor source relationship, time, etc., that are relevant to the behavior during the course of interaction and vary based on magnitude, dynamism, patterns, and combination and that appear different, differently to the actor than to others, or make an in-group, out-group differentiation of these elements depending on their individual and shared identities. And if you don't want to have this, et cetera, we can replace this with the seven elements that we get, came up with in the study. So this was a kind of a, a complex definition, but which, which sort of enc encompasses everything uh, that I could find on, on what context is. And then the book has uh, other limitations and discussions uh, as well. So there are parts which I haven't covered so far. And, and these were like things like uh, the literature review portions and uh, how to design research studies incorporating context and how, what's the movement between stereotyped and shared context. We talked a little bit about that and how can context overlap and change continuously. So we, yeah, we, talked, we talked about the 12 conclusions and then context now and how, it's, how it is likely to play a part in the near future. So I think I'm ready for your questions now. So you can unmute yourself and speak. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dania. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Dania, yes. OK, Naresh, can you hear me? I can hear you, Dania, yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much for it. It's a lot really to cover in one hour when you did a wonderful job. Thank, thank you, so Dania. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Seems that context is every, yeah, it's everywhere. It's anything, everywhere, whatever. Yes, anything and everywhere, pretty much, yeah. That's right. And, and maybe this, this slide is what it, what it is in, in a way from a research point of view. So how does context to you in this? I guess it's more inclusive of what possibly Dervin and others considered as context. Yes. Yeah, because typically it was like the situation, like the workplace or, uh, for example, in what um, the imposed the query, 
uh, I guess you you mentioned that uh, in your uh, in your book um, by the colleague at Florida State. Uh, Impose a query is for you know uh, school in a school environment, for example, yeah. where where kids are given an assignment that they have to do. So it's it's called the imposed query, which means they are assigned topics. Right. So they have no 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 liberty to choose their own topics, for example. Yeah. So that's that's a that's a uh, that's a context. Yes, and that I put in in this. Uh... The imposed query would fall under here when I say the task, right? Yes. So this is the environment where they are in. This is the, the student and this the, the task that comes about. That's the yeah. imposed query for that student. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Lee has a question, I believe. Oh, right? right. Or a comment? comment? Okay, comment. Yeah, hi. Go ahead. <laughs> I just really like how Can you speak louder? I can't hear you much. Yeah. I just really enjoyed how you incorporated the different roles of people and how that fits into context. Thank you. Because I, the things I've been reading recently, they don't really consider that. Okay. okay. Scott and Meredith. Uh, you're, you're muted, so I can't really hear you. Okay, Meredith has a... Uh, uh, did you hear Lee, Lee's comment? Yeah, I heard that, yeah, yeah. Okay, Meredith has a, has a comment or a question. Meredith, you need to unmute your mic, so click on your mic and unmute yourself. <laughs> okay. Unmute. Yeah, she's getting Thank there. You. Okay. So, one of the things we've done... Read this... Yes, theories of information behavior. Yeah. Yes. I'm seeing seven different theories we discussed that you covered. Just mute yours. I think it's, uh, it's Daniel. So we'll, we'll mute Daniel for, for that. Okay. So you're married. Yeah, okay. The volume, I guess. Yeah, okay. So, so the this was a really nice. I guess, I don't want to say mashup, but it is. It's all of it coming together and it makes a lot of sense to me. It's just neat to build theory off of everybody else. And this is a great example of that. Thank you, Meredith. And which are the seven theories that you were thinking of? Can you mention those? Uh, face theory, uh, info activities and work tasks, um, professional sense-making, and then there was another one that I didn't quite get to, but I'm, I'm, yes. Yes. Which one? So just having all those come together, it's like, oh, okay, yes. I can see how all this comes together now. So instead of just two pages and learning about this one and this one, how they all relate, that's actually very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. And in this, uh, I guess, let's see, can I guess he... Yeah, I can hear you, I can hear you, Dania. Hear yes, I can hear you, Dania, yeah. We can hear you. I can, I can hear you, Dania. Dania, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, we also use uh, uh, Donald Case and Lisa Gibbons' book, right. Looking for Information, so he mentioned that as well. There he, we also have CV development in uh, information science by uh, Diane Samuel, but we haven't gone over the information horizon, but we will. Okay. So different things that you really mentioned, and uh, you know, um, they are familiar with. So I guess that makes them happy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Danny. And I also teach this class uh, in Simmons, the theories of information science. And, uh, and in my class as well, we use both the theories book, which Meredith was showing right now, as well as uh, Donald cases and given uh, looking for information. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we, and we are updating a few things like the new articles and, and things as we go along. And they also updated in the projects that they're working on, uh, you know, series and, and so forth. So, nice. yeah. uh, Scott? Yeah. About context? Scott, you're muted, so maybe can you? Oh. I'll just uh, you, you, you. Okay, With, yeah. un, unmute. Okay, yeah, Scott, I can hear you. Yeah, can you? 
No, just uh, to uh, piggyback off of Meredith, I appreciate that holistic context or uh, the holistic picture that you've that you've painted for us. On context. On context, <laughs> right? Thank you, Scott. Okay, it, it's a lot. I think it's it's it, it, it's, it's very difficult to wrap your head around, especially when you're when you're a PhD student, uh, because it all it's everywhere, and then you're really trying to understand what it is. It took me a long time to get to it. And one of the things which uh, I've done in the book, I think that might be useful for you all, is that in the initial chapters of the book, I think it was in chapter one or two, let me get. Yeah, I have, uh, what I've done is that I've taken uh, different models uh, of information that seeking behavior, and I've tried to identify what is context. So the parts in blue are what, what context is in these models. So, so this is Wilson and Walsh's 96 model, and then uh, uh, this is Le Lecky, Lecky et al.'s model. These parts work task, roles, characteristics, source information. And this is uh, Bestrom's and Yavelin's model. So here you have uh, personal factors, subjective tasks. These are the models. The, the need and the behavior itself is not, not the context. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you have the behavior part, right, You're looking for evaluation, implementation, all of that is not context, the behavior itself. So I saw... Actually, if you think of in interaction with, with information or behavior, information behavior, right? That behavior itself is not context. So almost everything apart from the behavior could be, could be seen, of, seen as context. So I was, I was thinking that context is not the verb, but, not, but the nouns. And, uh, yes, Tanya, yeah. Yeah, and what's interesting about this, you know, showing, uh, highlighting context in these models uh, is that, um, some of them are implicit. Yes. Okay? They, yeah. they, you know, you look at them and say, oh, okay, yeah, stress, fine, that's emotional, that's, em you know, emotional state, feelings, whatever, but you don't think of it as context. Yes. Until, yes. until you really, you know, you look there and say, oh, yes, that's, that's in, you know, that's part of context. It's um, part of context, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and, and in, even in this model, right, model, right, in Wilson and Walsh's model, he has a separate box for context, which is called context of information need. And, and now when you think of it, it's not just a box, but other things are also context. Yeah. Right. And, and in his case, at, at that point in time, when he came up, when they came up with the model, they probably looked at only the context, which gives rise to the need. That's right. But one of the arguments which comes in the book is that the need also gives rise to context. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly. like, exactly. so, so it's yeah. and here you have other models like this is uh, Travel and his everyday life. So here in this model, almost everything is context except for this little thing of behavior. And uh, this is Son of Son and World's model in which it was completely context. So she actually tries to separate situation and context, but then all of that is also context when, from the way I was looking at it in the book. And this is Derwin's model. So here again, most of it is context. Also, one more thing is that the outcomes are not the context most of the time. Yeah, the out outcomes of situations because you're thinking of the behavior, right? Not the outcome of the behavior in this case. But yes, this outcome could, could be the context for the new set of behavior. But for yeah. that particular behavior, it's not the context. Yeah, that's one of the things I said, you know, the way you uh, actually um, uh, come up, uh, came up with a unified definition of context is that it's not one area. Like in those models, you see it as one box. One box, right, yes, one yes. One component, and then the other components. You know, uh, and, uh, yeah, exactly. Here, here uh, in your book, you see it as inclusive of so many different things, except for the behavior or the interaction itself. Or the interaction itself, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's a unique uh, way of looking at context. And I guess it makes it for people who are learning about information behavior easier to understand, you know, um, because it was a puzzling before. Okay, contact, okay, environment, situation, setting, you know, all these different kind of things. But do we consider the task that we give to users or the task that they come up with? Is it contacts? Right. Yeah, so, yeah, that's, that's interesting. It, it's, um, it stimulates lots of thinking and discussion around how how people you know view contacts thank you yeah yeah one of the things i'd like to ask you i'm very curious about the research about children uh, yes. 
yes. they knew. My students know, knew I'm going to ask this question. <laughs> yes. Um, lots of studies did include contacts, but I don't see them reflected in your book. Yes, um, I did talk about it in, in some cases. Um, I, I think, yeah, yeah it, it, it is there in chapter two where I'm talking about uh, portability and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. but yeah, but I, it covers more with the everything, like, uh, you know, it's more of the, I, I hate to, uh, like, make, divide them into two. It's like the adult. Yes, and I, and I, I think you are probably right in that. In the, most of my sources were drawn from, uh, the proceedings of the almost all the proceedings of the information seeking in context studies That's right. uh, that and, and those conferences and I think uh, children were not represented very well in those uh, uh, in, in those conferences I think so shall we do a book number two yes I think we could do a book number two focusing on context of uh, context uh, just from a children's studies point of view yeah. okay I think yes that that would be very interesting I think and, and, very, and very pertinent because there are also models that they do have contacts, but again, for children's studies, but they are implicit. Uh, I have, for example, task-based model that I developed based on the children's interaction yeah. uh, when I replicated the Marcellini's model. But I didn't think about task at that time in terms of contacts, you know? So yeah. now it makes me think about it more in terms of, well, and how could that be? How could we conceptualize these tasks in terms of context? So yes, and, and maybe we could do a research paper to begin with, like a, like a conceptual paper, uh -huh. right? And from a children's point of view. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, why not? Why not? Why yeah, yeah. Any takers here? <laughs> <laughs> <My students. laughs> I know, I know he's talking to me. <laughs> but I, I always like, uh, you know, to involve students in the research, at least to start thinking, you know, but their areas are different from mine. Uh, they are related to human information behavior in a way. Um, could you talk about your areas? Because they're very interesting. Um, Scott has a very interesting uh, topic and also it's for his dissertation, right? Collective action theory, okay? Yeah, Scott, you want to, you want to say? I'll share that. Um, um, as she said, I'm interested in collective action theory. Uh, what prompted that was my interest in the 2018 West Virginia teacher strike, where they used uh, social media to facilitate the um, they're organi organizing and, and to share information and strategies to, uh, for organizing themselves. They did that um, in spite of the fact that there were, there are two formal labor unions in the state, but they, the teachers themselves didn't feel like those unions were, were doing much of anything. And so they took it upon themselves to organize um, in sort of um, a crowdsourced way if you will, using Facebook Live, especially, but some other social media elements as well. So where does context lie in your research? In uh, a whole host of ways, yeah. There's context in terms of um, political dissent, uh, civic life and civic action, but also uh, collective identity. They drew upon the whole history and heritage of, of labor movements in the state of West Virginia. Uh, the context of their uh, occupations, I think, and and their roles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The space. The Look, space. Yes, absolutely, for sure. Just a whole host of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be interesting. So I would like love to hear about each of your areas and how context applies to it. Give it a shot. Uh, mine's a little weird. I'm looking at the kind of how politics and political identity influence how reenactors do their research and through the lenses of cognitive dissonance and cognitive authority and kind of like social positioning a little bit. So where they fit in, how their bias influences what sources they're using and how they trust them and yeah. So the biases, sources, all of, all of this is context, right? And, and, and anything that influences is also context. Oh, sorry. Uh, could you, sorry, could you repeat that you were on mute? So, so, you, so you said the biases are also context. 
anything that influences his, his context. Yes. In, in your case, right? Yeah. So whenever you talk about it, A influencing B, the A is always context. That yes. part in, in any interaction, yeah. yeah. And Meredith? Okay. Um, I'm very interested in subject matter experts, specifically in merit peer review. So the awarding of funds um, to peer reviewed proposals. And I'm looking at doing a bibliometric analysis, co-citation uh, analysis of how subject matter experts truly are connected. So some of this is to step away from conflicts of interest to determine them uh, before uh, even assigning an individual to a proposal, which we can do now, but to really um, beef that up a little bit, uh, but also to show that there are a lot of fields that we don't have enough people in. Um, we, uh, one I know from an example that I've worked on is geothermal engineering. We don't have enough people. We have to go to Europe to review those proposals because we don't have enough folks here. So context is nationality, uh, who, who's funding where, uh, who's applying where, how big and small are those subsets of um, professionals. Uh, of real interest to me also is uh, commercialization and technology transfer reviews. And those are very difficult because you have the, the end user, so the folks that use the wire copper or put up the lines as you're going down the street for a smart grid. How do those folks handle the information to make a good decision that this stuff should go and be funded? Whereas they, they may not be um, academically trained as others, but they're the end user, so would they buy it? Um, so it's, it's a, there, there's a lot of context depending on which way I go with it, uh, which way I focus there. <laughs> No, it's good because it also gets me to see the, uh, all the various ways in which you all understand context and, it, and how it applies to your own individual studies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Any, uh, uh, by the way, in, in his book also he has a section which is very helpful to researchers and students, you know, uh, and how to design studies. Yes. Where, uh, you know, incorporated context. So that's... Um, that's very helpful. Yeah, I think uh, so. That I have actually shown. Uh, it's, yeah. That's in chapter uh, five, uh, chapter four, I think, of the book. Uh, yeah. So here, when we go to the beginning part of this, uh, yeah. So this is a, uh, an an example of taking uh, the whole, all the all the variables and trying to put the variables that are applicable to your study in these different views. And then forming like independent and uh, mediating independent variables based on that study, and you can design studies based on that. And I've cited other studies which apply in the similar manner. So that way, the, everything is not overwhelming. Then you can actually try to make sense of uh, this whole, uh, all, all of these different kinds of variables that are there, and trying to see which ones are more applicable from here, and put them in the, in a in a way it makes sense in your studies then. Mm -hmm. In different areas. Okay, great. Any any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you, Dania. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yay! Thank you. We'll be in thank touch. You. Thanks so much. Yes, thank you, Dania. And how do I stop the recording? I think. Uh, uh, yeah.